I want to talk to you today about the message in the veil. This is the second part of our sermon series about oh, Jesus in the Old Testament. Last week we looked at the message in the substitute. The story of Abraham and Isaac. God gives Abraham a commandment to go and sacrifice his own son, the son he loves, Isaac. And just about as he was going to do that deed, an angel stops him and says, Don't, don't do it. I know now that you fear the Lord, this is only a test. And at the moment he sees a ram stuck in the bushes. So what Abraham does, he takes his own son Isaac off the altar. He takes the ram and places it on the altar. The ram becomes a substitute for Isaac. Where Isaac should have died, the ram took his place and died for him. In the same way, Jesus Christ became our substitute. In our sins, we deserve death and judgment and hell. But Jesus came and he took our place and he stood in between us and the Father and said, No, don't kill them. I will take it. I will take the punishment. I will take the pain. I will take the death. Jesus said, I will die so you may live. Today we're going to look at the second part. It's called the message in the veil. Out of all the uh, symbolisms in the Old Testament, there's none so rich in me as that of the tabernacle. Look at if you've heard that word. Some of you, okay, good. Tabernacle. The tabernacle was the sacred tent of God. This middle part, the sacred tent of God, which called the tent of meeting, because this is where God will meet His people. You see that pillar of cloud? By day it be a pillar of cloud, by night a pillar of fire. God will actually come down to the people of Israel, and this is where you meet them. Here is where you will talk to uh, Moses and Aaron, give him instructions to go forward. The tabernacle itself was actually divided into two areas the holy place and the holy of holies. And the only thing that separated those two areas was the veil. Can anybody see anything different in the church today? Yes. The veil. So that's what we're going to be speaking about today. The message in the veil. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up Exodus chapter 26. What we're doing in this series is looking at the first four books of the Old Testament. Last week we looked at Genesis. Today we're looking at Exodus. Next week we're looking at? Yes. Leviticus. Well done. All right. uh, Exodus 26 says, uh, Set up the tabernacle according to the plan shown you on the mountain. People think that Moses only got the Ten Commandments on the mountain, on Mount Sinai. That's not true. He actually received 155 additional commandments. He was up there for 11 months. Well, they were up there for 11 months. So he received a whole lot of other commandments besides the Ten Commandments. This was one of them. Make a curtain of blue and both in spiral. Blue and both in spiral. You are finally twisted linen, a cherubim woven into it by a skilled worker, hang it with gold hooks and four posts and acacia loop, overlaid with gold and standing on the four silver bases. And the curtain for the glass in place, the Ark of the Covenant law behind the curtain. I just so happened to have that Ark of the Covenant right here today. So this will be behind the curtain. The curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. The holy place from the most holy place. Put the atonement cover on the Ark of the Covenant law in the most holy place. This box has actually got a lid, which is called the mercy seat, the covering of the ark itself. So then we, we've tried to do today is try to replicate as much as best as possible this reading in Exodus. So what we're going to do today is look at the veil. But to understand the veil more closely, we've got to understand the tabernacle in context. So let's look at that tabernacle again. It's got the holy place and the most holy place, holy of holy. And what we've done in the church today is try to give you a visual representation of that tabernacle. The area in front of me is what we will call the Holy of Holies. And incidentally, this is almost the exact measurements of it was five by five meters. One, two, three, four, five. So it was this area in five meters down to the veil would be the Holy of Holies. From here to the back by your window, Amy, is another ten meters. Almost exactly it's incidental, that coincidental maybe, I don't know, or divinely inspired that this building is almost the exact measurements of the tabernacle. And from this side to there is a five meter mark. So you guys are currently in the holy place. You guys, sorry, you guys are sinners, right? You <laughs> just better make a great Maybe next time, man. Right? You guys, you guys are in the most holy place. Don't go there. That's for sinners. Don't go there. Guys, might be. Don't step out of the line. He's the veil dividing this area. And this was. A, a sacred king, and I've heard this funny joke about Sherlock Holmes and Watson. The all know Sherlock Holmes and Watson. They want to go camping one night, so they go out and they set up their tent and they go to bed. In the middle of the night, Sherlock Holmes wakes up 
And he wakes up, wakes up and says, what do you see? Wakes up and looks up and he says, I see all the beautiful stars in the sky. Sherlock Holmes says, well, what does that tell you? Watson says, well, theologically, this tells me this. It's a great God up in the universe that created all this. Astronomically, it tells me that there's billions of stars out in the universe. So the Watson says, Sherlock says, well, what does that tell you? Sherlock says, that tells me somebody stole our thing. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody would ever steal this thing. This was God's sacred thing. In fact, you couldn't even come here to it. The only people that were allowed in the tabernacle were the priests from the tribe of Levi, the Levitical priests. They could only interview. Only very, very important people, like the high priest once a year, would actually go into where the presence of God would be. This is where the presence of God would be on the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was actually divided, as I said, between the box and the lid itself. And the reason it's got a lid is because there's something inside there. Who knows what's inside the Ark of the Covenant? Thank you, Mark. Anything else? There's three items the star. One more for a million bucks going just today is a pot of manna. Let me see the pot of manna. So I'm going to show you those little items right now. In the ark was placed the Ten Commandments. Cool. As, as heavy as I can get. God will. In Hebrew. This is the second tablet because the first one was broken. As Moses came down the mountain, he broke the first one written by God. When he went up to get the second pair, but he knew what God said, you write it yourself. So the second pair was actually written by Moses himself. And then you get the pot of manna with some manna inside there. This is all bread from 1997, so I wouldn't want to eat it right now. But right, the pot of manna, <coughs> and then also orange stock that I didn't read. So you have three items in here, and these are very symbolic and important. It was actually signs of Israel's sin and rebellion. The manna was their stuff which God provided for them, but they complained and grumbled throughout the years. They rejected his provision. They rejected the spiritual leadership of Aaron and the high priest. And they rejected the Ten Commandments. Because as soon as Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, they were already breaking the first commandment and the worship in the night. So this is actually a sign of the sin and rebellion of the people of Israel. He said to Moses, put it in your ark and cover it up with a lid. So there we have the ark of the covenant. You see, the ark of the covenant is now missing. It's the most sacred object ever probably in religious history, and it's no longer to be found. And people don't know where it disappeared. There's no actual record of where it actually went. Some people believe that the Jews actually still buried it under the Temple Mount today. Remember I showed you the Dome of the Rock? <laughs> Some people believe that underneath there, there's like a hidden chamber where this ark is still there. Some people believe that it's actually in Ethiopia. The Queen of Sheba, which is ancient, ancient the Ethiopia area, in Yemen and Ethiopia, her son Menelik went to visit Solomon, and it is believed that he actually stole the ark which came back to Ethiopia. Right now today, in Aksu, there's a church which is heavily guarded because they believe the actual ark of the covenant is in there. Well, some of you like Indiana Jones, they might be in a warehouse in America with all things of the Nazi sign. Remember that movie of Indiana Jones? So this is the ark of the covenant, the most sacred object in all of the world. Let's look at the second part. For now, I'm going to be closing up the veil. All right, because I don't want you to see what happens behind the veil. Inside the holy place. Inside the holy place is this section. And some of you can see there. And some of you will see it actually here. On the one side of the wall was the golden menorah, the candlestick. That was a seven tier golden candlestick. This is not a seven tier golden candlestick. But if you had a seven tier golden candlestick, don't make it in the church, God will be too messy. And then this was to illuminate the place because this is a thing. You must remember there's curtains over there. It's dark. Key curtains coming very dark and stuff. So they need to get light off the form there in the same of Jesus. They used to light this to illuminate the place. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who walks in me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of God. On the other side of the wall was another table for your benefit, only showbread. And on it, it had 12 pieces. Of unleavened bread. This is by someone in the church who went all the way to Sandwich Park to get this for you. 
I'm Levin Gregory, Julian Munson, you can see his fierce and strife. Twelve, representing the twelve tribes of Israel. They have to replace this every summer. Every Saturday they should come in and replace the bread. Then the only other object that was here, which I'll bring up right now, which is called the altar of incense. You can see it there, you guys, there's a table and there's incense. So I've really gone right through the Greek's version and got my incense. And by the end of the I don't know how this stuff works, you can see I find a bone on it. So those who don't know what this is, this is like some sort of incense fragrance. But what you're supposed to do, apparently, is leave it in here and then every 24 hours you just turn it around. And I didn't know that I thought this was genuine incense. I was like burning this thing in. Nothing happened with this stupid incense. Anyway, I got it and it was a beautiful fragrance. <laughs> so this is the altar of incense. And this was placed right next to the veil. Right close to the veil. These two weren't. They were in the middle against the wall. This was placed right here. And what they used to do there is to do this. It's like a candle. They used to bring frankincense and hope, put it on a pole. And then release it beautifully woven in fragrance. And also, it's a bit practical because remember, this was a tabernacle use for sacrifices. So, outside, there would be a lot of smell from the blood and the burnt offerings. And this actually just put from the fragrance inside here. All right. And this also represented, according to the Jews, the prayers of the people rising up to God. And only the priests would work in here. They could come here, they could not keep it on here, they could not go on the side, they could not dare look on this side. They could only focus their attention here. Only one person could go into the Holy of Holies. The High Priest. So we need a High Priest. So we're going to call my High Priest. Who said that? Just like that, you knock and the High Priest comes money. Of course you have the power of life. It's more like she has the power of me. What would happen was once a year on the day called Yom Kippur. Kippur is Hebrew for covering or covering. Yom Kippur, it actually happens in about 15th of September this year, that would be September and October. Once a year, the high priest would come in with the blood of an animal. And only he was allowed to enter in to the most holy place. So here he comes, I don't know where he's coming, he's coming to that side, I think. The high priest would come through, he would collect the blood from outside, from the animal. He would come through only once a year, and only he was allowed to enter through the veil. The high priest would enter through, and now I'm going to open it up so you can see what the high priest will do. The high priest, the high priest will then come to the Ark of Covenant. What he will do with the blood of the lamb or the bull, he will take some and he will sprinkle it on the lid of the covenant. Very dramatic, isn't it? <laughs> he will sprinkle it on there. What was inside there? The sin and rebellion of the people. God said, this is your sin. And unless I see the blood, those sins are not going to be forgiven. So God sees the blood of the innocent animal. And God says, I see the blood now. And now I forgive you and your family, Aaron. This is the high priest. And I also forgive the people of their sins. Just incidentally, this was, I've got the whole full outfit for you today. But when the high priest actually entered into this area once a year, he would actually take all this clothes off and only wear the white garment. So this he would wear throughout the year, all the time. But when he came in here, he would actually take all this off. And one more thing, do you, did you hear the bells? Mm -hmm. Did you hear the bells? Jingle bells? No, not jingle bells, right? <laughs> Some tradition says that those bells were actually for a purpose. Because when the high priest would come in, you understand what it means? They would actually tie a rope around his ankle. The guys inside, either you a priest, you would tie a rope around his ankle. He would come in here perform his duties. And you would hear the bells just jingle, jingle, as you walk. They would hear, and if the bell stopped, then he done something wrong, and God had killed him. What is the rope for? To put him back out. So you just imagine they put him back out. Next! <laughs> <laughs> Bob Gurry! When you ask me, that must be. But actually, I don't believe that it's true. It's tradition. Not the people. And as I said, the high priest did not wear this when he came in here. He would have only worn the white one. So that is a tradition, and you'll probably hear that mentioned lots of times in books, but I don't believe it's actually biblical. I priest, thank you for your wonderful job. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> so this was the Ark of the Covenant. God saw the blood to give the people of their sins. The high priest would go out and again slip out the veil, and no one was allowed to pass the veil. So now let's take some time looking at the veil. 
the veil itself. The first part is the pattern of the veil. As I pull this, what color am I putting? Blue. What color is this? Scarlet red. And the last one that I least is purple. So that's exactly what the Bible says. It says, make a tabernacle of curtains of fine crystal linen of blue and purple and scarlet yarn. The cherubim work into the muscular. So the colors point to Jesus Christ. The blue symbolizes heaven, symbolizes the sky. Jesus Christ came from heaven. And when he ascended, he died and resurrected and ascended, he went back to heaven. This represents Jesus as the Son of God. The deity, the purple is always a symbol of royalty throughout the Bible. Jesus is the Lord of Lords and also the King of Kings. Isn't that true? The red is always a symbol of black. It's obviously that falls into Jesus. Because his blood that was shed, or maybe even at the last supper, Jesus takes a cup and he drinks it and says, This is a cup of the new covenant of the blood that was shed for me. So in these three colors, in the pattern of the veil, it points and foreshadows Jesus Christ and his mercy. So let's look at the second part. The purpose. What is the purpose of the veil? The purpose was to separate the holy place from most holy place. But it was deeper than that. It was more like a barrier. As I said, you guys could not come in here. No one could peek behind the door of the unless God specifically told that person to come in. Not even Aaron, the high priest, could do this. In the Leviticus, it says this The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place. Inside the veil, this time, before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, or he will die. God appeared in the crowd of mercy. See, God is in the fear of the crowd. And he said, Listen, don't just get your brother willy nilly come in here, walk around like you're over the place. No one is allowed in here unless I say they can come in. And even when the high priest came in, we take incense. You know, in the Catholic Church and the Orthodox churches, the priests would walk with the incense golden bowl. They would do that. They would come in here and they would fill this place up with smoke because the high priest could not even look upon God. Could not see the glory of God. Even Moses could not see the face of God. God said, If you see me, you'll die. No one could come in here and see God. And God made that very, very clear. This veil was not just a curtain, it was a barrier separating sinful man from a very, very holy God. Even on the curtain, there were embroidered cherubim. That's angels. The first cherubim we find in Genesis, when Adam and Eve got picked out one year. It was cherubims that were placed at the, the gate, at the entrance, and that they didn't allow anybody in. These cherubims symbolize the same thing. You can imagine two big angels standing there with salt. You say, no, 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 this is like, you, you can't come in. Do not pass to me. You do not collect 200 men. You do not go past here. Yeah. So this was a barrier separating sinful man from a holy God. This is what it says in Isaiah. But your iniquities, your sins, your wrongdoings, your mistakes and your failures have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Let me tell you what, maybe some of you know what we do. You are sinners. Even on your best day, you're still a sinner. Come in, high priest and his wife. What <laughs> uh, The priest could have wives. <laughs> um, thank you, Tony. Uh, it says here that because of your sin, you are separated from God. You are enemy of You are never getting in His presence because you are a sinner. God is holy. God cannot look upon sin. And all of us were born into sin. The day we were born, open our eyes and cried out. We were born into sin. And from that day, we were separated from God. And this is what it says. It says because of your sins, you can never enter into His presence. That's the bad news. Because of your sin, you cannot come to where God is. The good news is, there's somebody who paid the price. So we could. This is the Colossians. The parting of the veil. It says this. Now we jump from Exodus, right in the New Testament, to Matthew 27. And when Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, it is finished. The letter started. The letter started. It is finished. He gave up his spirit. And at the moment, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Something that you wouldn't have seen with this veil is the fact that it was one embroidered piece. It wasn't loose like I got it. This was blue and red. This was one piece. All you put together it wasn't separate like this. And the other thing was, it was 10 curtains thick. So it was a duck curtain. Really, really thick. And very, very long. It was 
five meters up, and the temple is probably even longer because that was refurbished and redesigned by Solomon and Herod. So this is very thick curtain, very high curtain. The Bible says it was torn from top to bottom. If it was a torn from bottom, we can still understand maybe in the end coming into the storm. A man could have maybe done that with a sharp knife, but not top to bottom. It shows that this was God and God only. At the time Jesus Christ died, God Himself tore this in half and separated the veil in two. Can you imagine what the priest must have thought on this side when that happened? For one and a half thousand years, no one was allowed behind him. No one saw what was going on. No one even had a glimpse of half of God. At this time when Jesus Christ died, this parted and all the priests in the earth for the first time in one thousand six hundred years got a glimpse of what was on the other side. I imagine they just ran out. That's how scared they must have been. Because they knew the requirements. Once you become you die. You're a sinner and you're going to be judged. But if you see God again. <laughs> so they must have just kept like cockroaches. Run out of here. On the day when Jesus Christ died, I'm pointing to the cross on the wall. It was just outside the temple. On the Mount Calvary, on the ridges of Mount Moriah. Jesus Christ died at 3 o'clock. He was crucified at 9 o'clock. Which means he spent 6 hours in excruciating pain. In, 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 in pain that he cannot even imagine. And he stayed there for 6 hours for you and me. And willingly. He waited. And he waited in that pain and he waited to die. Because not only, not only be at the time he died when he knew that the job was done. He was finished. And at that time, 3 o'clock, at the time when the priests were busy preparing their evening sacrifices. Jesus Christ died. At that moment, the veil was parted. Such a clear, simple, crystal clear message. The way to God was now open. No longer did you need a high priest once a year to come in with a little bottle of blood. No more do you need all the sacrifices to be done. God would say, no, anybody can come to me. Not the high priest, not the priest, not the problem. He got any Jew, any Chinese person, any Russian person, any African, any Kosa, any white person can come now into the presence of God. And you don't come by your own merit, you don't come by your good works, because on your best day you are a sinner. You come here on the merit of Jesus Christ, and He shed blood on the cross of God. That's what the message in the veil is. God was saying it's open. You can come now into my presence and be forgiven. All of us have a box. All of us have a box. Some of us have bigger boxes than others because you have more home duties and more sins than others. Some of us have more tissue box. <laughs> but we've all got a box. And in that box we have our sins and our mistakes and our home duties. And God places it in that box. And, and, and unless we got our sins in this box, God says, well, that's it for you tickets, man. That's your sin and you deserve to be judged and punished. But now it changes. Because Jesus Christ has laid his own blood upon the mercy. And God sees the blood of his son Jesus. He said, now I forgive you, Raymond, Tony, Aaliyah, forgive you, Ivor. I forgive you of your sins because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? The message in the veil. I'm going to close the service with just one more verse, an important verse in Hebrews. They found this is perhaps this whole thing. Hebrews 10, the right of Hebrews, writes, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. The most holy place. Before you couldn't do it. But he said, now you can. Brothers and sisters, you're at the same mark. Before we move to the other church. You guys can now cross over into the most holy place. And how do you do that? By your good works? No! By the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way open us through the curtain that is his body. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was punished and crushed and pierced and striped and he was torn for you and I. This represents Jesus and his body that is torn for you. He says we enter into here to the veil, to Jesus and only him. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Now you in this church today, have the opportunity to receive Jesus as your Savior. And as you do that, you are saying, I believe, Jesus, that you died for my sins. And I come to God, not in my own merits and my own good deeds or good works, because they mean nothing. I come to you, Father God, through the blood of your Son, Jesus. And you can draw close to God and enter 
into the glory and the power and the forgiveness of his love. This is a very simple but beautiful message. It's a message in the Bible. Amen. Amen. Amen.